was someone who denied the basics of the faith, resulting in the rejection of salvation. So at that time, a heretic was very plainly somebody who had rejected the doctrine of Christ, who had rejected who Christ Jesus was, and, uh, and, and they were considered a heretic. Uh, predestinarianism, uh, an extreme belief in predestination, which removes the necessity of the new birth. So at that time, there were some that didn't believe the new birth was even necessary any longer. They were predestined. And so those, those errors started creeping in, all right? And, and those things were very dangerous. We talked last week about Vigilantius, who was that one of those heroes that fought the, the writings of origin that had come about in Jerome uh, and his Latin Vulgate and all those other things. And, and, and Vigilantius was one that fought against the, uh, the, the heresies of origin and things like that. Uh, all right, in the 5th century, there were some men that arose that they had a problem with the heresies of the time. One was Experius. He was a bishop of Toulouse. Carried, he carried the Eucharist around, which is the, the bread, all right? He carried it around in a wicker basket in protest of the Catholic Church's worshiping the bread host. He did this to the horror of the Pope. So basically, he would carry around what they used for the Lord's Supper in a wicker basket, and the reason he did that was because at that time, Rome was worshiping the bread like they do now. They would worship the bread. They would, they would um, uh, idolize it. They would say that it, it turned into God, right? It turned into Jesus and all those things. So in order to mock that, he stood up and, and he carried around in a wicker basket, which horrified the Pope. Because he was like, what happens if it spills out? Then Jesus is going to be spilled out all over the ground. So you have to understand that, you know, there were men that would rise up against those superstitions and those foolish things, right? Much like there is now. Sopatisiris uh, is another man. And we're going to read some of these writings. Vizentius of Lorenz, he wrote... Something called the Commentorium asserted that the church can make progress in the knowledge of the truth, but not change the truth, right? So we, would you agree that you and I, because we have the, King, the, the benefit of having the King James Bible for the last 400 years, we have, the, the churches have, uh, that follow that Bible have, have had access to that Bible, that they have grown in truth and knowledge and understanding the longer that you have the, the scriptures accessible to you? Well, that's what he was talking about. But he said, you're not allowed to change the truth. You can grow in that truth and you'll learn new things about the uh, new things in the light of that truth, but you're not going to change the truth, right? They were changing the truth. And he, he made very clearly very clear that you can't do that, okay? That's not biblical. Salvain and Marcellius asserted faith must be based only on Scripture. Salvain opposed the prohibition of marriage and prayers for the dead. He preached repentance. And we're going to talk about that uh, in this book here today. I'm going to read you a bunch of this book here uh, that's going to talk about the times that they lived in. Selenius, the bishop of Gallia, uh, rejected the Apocrypha and Purgatory. He opposed transubstantiation on the grounds that Christ could not eat of his own flesh. <laughs> his argument against transubstantiation said Christ can't eat his own flesh. So how in the world could transubstantiation be true? If that turns into that, Christ had the Lord's Supper. He, had, he observed that Passover. He instituted it. He wasn't eating his own flesh, Right? So good argument. He made a very valid argument that that's not what Christ would do. And nowhere in the scriptures is that found. Prosper, a layman from Aquitaine, a writer who rejected the idea of intent, writing that if the intentions of the minister are necessary for the salvation of the persons being baptized, then salvation would not be freely of grace. He's saying if salvation becomes in the hands of a man and it's his intent for you, right, then you're in trouble. Because that's not based off of off the gospel, the free grace of God. That's based off of someone else's merits. You understand that? So he, he rejected that and he stood up against that. Uh, Faustus, a bishop, uh, wrote against that too. And, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit here today. So Brother Beller covers that there. And in, um, 
in our history here. Now this picks up where we left off from Vigilantius and moves on to that 5th century. And um, there were men that, able men that stood up. Experius is one of those bishops of Toulouse. That holy bishop, like we talked about, carried the Eucharist in a wicker basket and, way, and a way by no means agreeable to the custom of the Church of Rome, where it accompanied with quite a different ceremony. First, because it, it is made the object of adoration, and that in the very streets. So Rome would have that adoration in the streets, right? Secondly, because people dare not touch the least crumb of it as being persuaded that the body of Jesus Christ, which is in the most, which is in the host multiples, according to the number of the crumbs into which the host may be broken. That was Rome's argument. Thirdly, because by this means it might come to be trod underfoot or lost, upon which a thousand inconveniences must follow. So what do we do if we have leftover bread and juice? Well, somebody might drink it or somebody might throw it away. I'm sure we drink, the, drink what's left over, right? But there's nothing holy about that, right? There's nothing that, that conveys salvation in that. There's nothing uh, spiritual about that beyond the ceremony that God uh, has called us to to. Uh, to observe, right? The ordinance that God has called us to observe. There's nothing. That's what's holy because Christ commanded it. So we observe the Lord's Supper. This do in remembrance of me. After that is over, there is nothing different about that, those, the, that food, that bread, and that juice. They are pictures. During it, there is no sa saving grace in that, right? There, there's nothing in that. There's, no, th there's nothing uh, that, that would constitute that, but that's what these people believed, and that's what men like the Bishop of Toulouse would argue. Uh, it is worth observing here concerning this custom of carrying the Eucharist about, which was in use in the second century, as appears from the writings of Justin Martyr, that it differed very much from what we find in the Romish church since the 12th century. For indeed, since that time, Rome has taken great care to obtain laws whereby all that walk in the streets, whether Jews, heathens, or Christians, might be compelled to adore what she looks upon as her God. I mean, you have to understand, these people are very specific. You go to these foreign countries, they still observe these things today. They look at that host as, that's God. The cookie God. You ever heard that uh, chick track, the cookie God? I mean, that he's not exaggerating. He's telling you what they believe. But we find nothing like this in any, any law of the emperors of Christian princes is in favor of the adoration of the Eucharist. The second witness whom we may consult about the state of the diocese is Sopatus Severus. He was a monk. And since he wrote at a time when the zeal for that kind of life did transport the best men, we need not wonder that he asserted some many strange fables into his writings as well as the truth. But after all, it is certain uh, that, that, that this leaven of a monistic spirit, we find many characters of the very pure divinity in his books. So he wrote scripture about pure scripture also. But you have to understand these times were becoming mixed with so much idolatry. But is it much different than now? If you look at all the churches today and you look at Bible-believing churches and then you look at apostate ones, is it any different today? It isn't really. It's the same thing. Uh, let's see. Anyway, um, he owns, here's where Rome guy had a problem with him because he owned the second commandment and distinguish it from the first. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Neither doth he split the last command into two as the church of Rome does at present. For he concludes the Decalogue in this manner. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covet anything that is thy neighbor's, right? So what he's saying is he's, he, he rightly explains that Rome has changed the Ten Commandments. They perverted God's law. He was so little persuaded that the name of Catholic was a solid character of the true church. Listen to this, that he confesses that Arianism had infected all the world. And these contests proceeded so far that the whole world became involved in this wickedness. For Valens and Eurasicus, with the rest whose names we have mentioned, had infected Italy, Illyricum, and the East. He minded the Pope's power of suppressing heresy so little that he owned St. Hilary to have 
uh, reserved, preserved Gaul. He says this, Thus much was known of all by the sole endeavors of Hillary. Our Gaul was delivered from the infection of heresy. He, he couldn't stand the Pope. He had a problem with the Pope. He shows so violent an aversion to the spirit of persecution that he very sharply reproves Ithacus. So here's the spirit that he was of. He, he hated persecution. You want to mark the true saints of God? When you find them down through the centuries, you'll find them with the book, you'll find them with the church, and you'll find them with the doctrine of Christ. What is the doctrine of Christ? Well, it's many things, but it's who Christ is, but it's also how Christ acted. What does that mean? That when you, look, when you see the true church of the Lord Jesus Christ, they follow the scriptures, right? They have the Bible, they follow the scriptures, and they do not persecute people who are wrong. They do not kill heretics. They do not burn heretics. They are not shy to call men heretics if they are heretics. But their definition of a heretic is against the doctrine of Christ, right? But their goal is to reach those heretics, not to kill them. That's the difference. We don't kill people who are wrong about Christ. We witness to them so they can be right, so they can be saved. That's the difference. That's always been the difference. Amen? He shows so violent an aversion to the spirit of persecution that he very sharply reproves Ithacus for using the Priscillanists hardly, who were a branch of the Manichees that had settled themselves in Spain, and for persuading the emperor Gratian to banish them. Is, saith he, but he above measure and beyond what ought to have been done, provoking Ithacus and his fellows, helped to blow the flame and exasperate these wicked men rather than suppress them. So what is he saying? He's saying, we recognize these heretics are wicked. They're teaching wrongly. But you should not ask the emperor to persecute them. Right? You shouldn't ask the emperor to kill them. Whereupon Itticus and Ithacus began to double their endeavors, supposing that the mischief might be suppressed in its beginning. But being ill-advised, they addressed themselves to secular judges, that by their decrees and executions, the heretics might be banished by the cities. Thus, after many and base intrigues upon Itticus, petitioning an order was drawn from Gratian and then the emperor. So they went to the emperor to have these heretics persecuted. He draws such a parallel between St. Ambrose and Pope Damasus, and he attributes to them the supreme authority of the church, which does not at all agree with the notion of the papacy. So he rejects the papacy. Then they begin to change their measures, and because they could not delude the two bishops, whose authority was supreme at the time. He informs us that the tendency is of the, is of the worship given to martyrs by the history he gives use of an altar, which the popular superstition had rendered famous because they pretended that some martyrs had been buried in that place. St. Martin, whose life is described by our author, not being able to make any certain discovery of the name of this martyr and the circumstances of his sufferings and being loath absolutely to doubt of the truth of it, thought fit himself to go to the famous sepulcher in company of some of his brethren being come to this place. He earnestly begged of God to reveal to him the name and merit of this martyr. And afterwards, turning himself towards the left, he sees standing there a hideous, terrible ghost. They command him to, compare, to, compare, to declare himself the ghost obeys. He tells his name, confesses this crime, that he had been executed for robbery, and that it was only the error of the people caused him to be canonized, that he was in nothing like the martyrs who were in glory, whereas he was in pain. The good St. Martin, being troubled to hear this account, caused the altar to be carried to another place, and so saith our author, delivered the people from a superstitious error. Now, whatever that is true, we don't need it, and nor do we care about what somebody some spirit that is there or not there. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you're to worship at the, at the grave. Now, there's nothing wrong with going to a grave site. There's nothing wrong with doing that. What is wrong with, uh, the Bible talks about having a funeral and burying your dead and putting them out of your sight, right? Having a ceremony. That's a proper grieving process. By the way, you ought to do that. If somebody that loves you dies, you ought to take time to grieve that. And you ought to take time to look at that. And you ought to take time to reflect upon that. And you ought to take proper time. If you don't, it will revisit you. It will. 
You don't just shove grief down and shove the loss of people that were in your life down like it doesn't affect you. It does affect you. Deal with it, grieve it properly, and then move on. But deal with it. If you don't deal with it, it will come back. And when it comes back, it will be 10 times worse than it would have been if had you dealt with it. And I mean that wholeheartedly. I can tell you from experience, I have seen people that did not deal with grief properly. I am one of them that did not take the time to grieve different things. And it affected me greatly later on. And I know of another person that, that, that it happened to that, that extremely bad things happened to them because of that. You got to deal with things properly. However, what did these people do? They worshiped at the tombs of martyrs. No. Not biblical. He declares the custom of carrying images of the saints through the parishes was no better than a custom derived from the heathens. The same saint, saith he, only by accident saw a company of heathens at a distance who accompanied the body of a heathen to the grave. But finding himself too far off to discover what they were about and perceiving the winds to wave the linen whereof the dead body was covered, he imagined they were employed about the profane ceremonies of their sacrifices. And the reason he gives of it is because it was the custom of the country people of Gaul to carry madly about their grounds the images of demons covered over a white veil. What does Rome do? What do the Greek Orthodox do? Same thing. Images of people. And they fall down and they worship those images. He lays down a very remarkable maxim for the Albigenses. Listen, will you listen to this very closely? Because this is good advice. It's also good understanding of the Albigenses. He says this, that gold was not the means of building, but rather of destroying the church, which those of the church of Rome could never forgive him as appears by their censures in the margin. They got mad at him for saying that. He goes, when churches get rich, they get in trouble. I want you to turn to Revelation. Revelation chapter 3. Now, I believe these are all type, these are seven types of churches that are here today, right? Verse number 13, Revelation chapter 3, verse number 13. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou art cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. He's speaking to that Laodicean church. Well, where was that church? Well, you just heard it. It's the church of Laodicea. You say, well, I thought that was such and such dispensation. Well, it may be a picture of that. I don't think it is, personally. I think it's just a picture. I think all of those churches are present with us today. All of those kinds of churches are present with us today. I think there's Philadelphian churches. I think there's Laodicean churches. I think there's a church like the church of Ephesus. I think all seven of those churches, there are, that's not an accident, by the way, that God uses those numbers, right? That God, that, that's not an accident. I believe that that was a real church, don't you? He wrote it to the church of Laodicea. That means it was a real church, but it's also a picture of the churches that would come, right? And what is that church? Laodicea. And what, what does that Laodicea stand for? Well, they were rich. They had money. What's the Bible say about the rich church? Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest thou that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to, be, me, thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich in white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed in the shame of thy nakedness to not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eyes that thou mayest see. 
As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. That's why this man says to you right here, some thousand years ago or so, 1,500 years ago, what was he saying? He's saying, this is bad. Gold doesn't help the church. It tears it down. When the emperors decided to institute Christianity, that gold was a means of destroying. Right? He severally blames the conduct of those who em employ violence against such as do not acquiesce to in their decisions. He went, saith he, to Alexandria, but you would not make any stay in a place where the reproach of their intestine slaughters was yet fresh. For though perhaps it was their duty to have obeyed the bishops, yet such a vast number of persons living in the confession of Christ ought not to have been afflicted in that manner, especially by the bishops. He talks about their cruelty in, in Alexandria. He acquaints us with an unjust proceedings of the Spanish bishops against the Priscillianists. Maximus, the emperor, otherwise a very good man, being spoiled by the counsel of the priest after the Priscillian death, did by his kingly power defend Ithacus, the bishop, Priscillian's accuser, and the rest of his associates, that no body might reflect on him as if by his procurement any man had been condemned. The day before the emperor had already, according to their liking, resolved to send tribunes with full power into Spain to examine those that were heretics and being found such to take away their lives and estates. So if they were found as heretics, take their lives and their estates away from them. Neither was it to be doubted but that this storm would have reached the greatest part of believers because of the small distinction made between them and the other. For then they judge persons only by the eye, esteeming them heretics from their pale looks or habit rather than by their faith. So they looked at somebody that was pale, like Jacob, and they said that, oh, sorry, Jacob. They looked at Jacob and they, they said, you know, he, that guy must be a heretic because he's pale. No, I'm not kidding you. That's how stupid it was. What's that? Oh, they were done. He afterwards shows the horrors that St. Martin had conceived against these kind of proceedings. There was nothing he was more concerned about than to prevent the tribunes being sent into Spain with the power of the sword. He renounced communion with these sanguinary bishops, but not long after to avoid a greater mischief, he was obliged to give up that point, though he still refused to subscribe to the condemnation of the Priscillianists. Martin communicated with them at the time, thinking it better for a while to give way to them than not to provide for their safety, who had sword hanging over them. But yet, though the bishops used their utmost endeavors to make him ratify his communicating with them by his subscription, they could never bring him to do it. He wouldn't give in. He wouldn't persecute those people. Vizintius was a priest of the monastery of Atlerans and one of those who can best inform us as to what the esteemed Orthodox in these churches believed. Indeed, we find all their peculiar doctrines of the Church of Rome are condemned in the maxims that he solidly asserts. The understanding, knowledge, and wisdom of well, as well as of every single person as the whole church ought to grow and greatly increase according to several degrees of times and ages, but everyone in his own way, that is to say, in the same doctrine, in the same sense, in the same judgment. So not to take on her, uh, spurious beliefs and change the beliefs of the scriptures. He reduces all that we ought to believe to the rule of faith and declares what is the true use and true authority of the doctors of the church, which is the scriptures, right? But yet the primitive consent of the Holy Fathers is to be inquired after and followed as to the lesser questions of divine law alike, but especially if not only in the rule of faith, which fathers we may give full credit to on this condition, that whatsoever all or most of them do in the same sense manifestly, frequently, and constantly maintain, as in the Council of Masters agreeing together by their receiving, holding, and delivering the same, that ought to be esteemed unquestionable or certain and firm. So the Bible, they go back to the scriptures. He lays down a method how we may dispute with the Church of Rome about the errors she has drawn from antiquity by reducing the whole dispute to the Scriptures. All of your arguments should be the Scriptures, right? Wherefore, we are no other way to convict all ancient errors of schism or heresy, but either, if need be, by the sole authority of Scripture, 
or else to avoid them is already condemned by the universal councils of Catholic priests, which would have been those that believed universally the same things concerning the scriptures. He excellently explains the use of tradition without degrading anything from the sufficiency of scripture. He says, yeah, you can look at tradition after you've looked at the Bible, right? you got to look at the scriptures first and foremost, and that's your sole authority. If your forefathers did right, great, talk about it. If they did wrong, explain why they were wrong, but move on. Don't follow the errors. That's, that's all he's saying, right? Which is Bible, that's what we say. That's as we trace this Baptist history. We're going to find errors with these Baptists that they had, that they held to, they, some of them held to. What do you mean? It can you explain what you mean by that? Follow the fathers that did error. Yes, they were. Yeah. Right? To honor them. They were right. And you will find your whole life that you will be tempted to honor things other than God. Over God. Government will try to get you to honor things. There may be a pastor that tries to get you to honor things. Or a church that tries to get you to honor things over God. Over the truth of scripture. Right? Uh, or parents. Right? Jesus talked about that, right? We talked about that today, that that truth brings a sword, right? That there is going to be differences, right? There is going to be differences. So understand that. That's, that, that's going to happen. You're going to have family, friends, others, believers, other preachers, other people. Always you have to give your loyalty and your allegiance to Christ, amen, and to the Word of God. That's the battle that we all face. Let's see. Uh, let's see, a man named Cassian, a priest, the disciple of Chrysostom, hath writ much about concerning the, in, the institutes of the monks, according as we find in his writings. He saith, the young monks, monks observe the rules prescribed to them so exactly that without leave obtained from their abbot, they dare not only not stir up their cells, but what is more, not so much as satisfy the common necessities of nature. See, here's the danger that comes up with monks, with that, that monk movement. What happened was some of them started to be separated, right? And they wanted to be separated from the world. And Christianity was so apostate that they just they got in their monasteries, they became monks, and they secluded themselves from the wicked world. Problem is, is that they disobeyed the other parts of the scriptures because you're to be a light to the world. And how is a monk a light to the world, Right? It's just like those other communities, Amish and Mennonite and, and some of those other communities. Uh, some of the things they're for are not bad things. But what they're doing is they isolate themselves and they literally become monks. That's almost what they become in their own communities. And they don't have anything to do with the outside world. But that's not how you're a light. And that's the monastery type setup and system is, is not profitable at all, period, in that sense, to the gospel. And by the way, it leads to other errors. It leads to that monastery monk system. It leads to other errors, big time errors. So uh, then to prevent the tribunes being sent into Spain with the power of the sword, he renounced communion with these. Whoops, I got the wrong one. That was, that was good, but I already said that. So let's move on here. Let's see. Here we go. Sorry about that. Okay. He says this about the monks, though. He says that without, uh, let's see, he shows that covetousness began already to reign among the monks of his time. Our third conflict is with the love of money, he said, a foreign and unnatural war and which arises in monks from the sluggishness of a corrupt and benumbed mind and very oft grounded upon an inconsiderate entrance upon a self-denying life and a lukewarm love towards God. He cannot bear the impudence of those covetous monks who defended themselves with the words of Jesus Christ. It is more glorious to give than to receive. <laughs> they took that on the backside. <laughs> he censures the impertinent interpretation which some monks put upon these words of Christ. Whosoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Which some of the strictest monks, having a zeal for God but not according to knowledge, taking too literally, they li listen to what they did. By the way, we talked about that this morning, that verse. Take up your cross and follow. Well, here's what the monks did. Are you ready? 
with some of the strictest monks having a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge, taking too literally, made themselves wooden crosses, and by carrying them about upon their shoulders, instead of edifying, provoked those that saw them to laughter. Yep. Yeah, they have crucifixions down in the Philippines and other areas like that. They, they mock the crucifixion, and they, they go through the streets, and they're crucified, right? And they carry a cross there. He informs us that the monks of Egypt were, 40, were, were no scrupulous observers of their fasts, that they made no difficulty of breaking them in order to discharge some duty which appeared or more important to them. Cassian tells he was surprised at it uh, about what they did. It appears also they did not believe the scriptures to be, to be so obscure as, to day, as at this day they are supposed to be. We may see that the abbot of Theodorus thought of this matter we find it set down by him that a monk who desires to attain to the knowledge of scripture ought not to spend this time upon commentators but rather bend and apply his utmost industry and attention to the purging himself from the fleshly lusts which if they are once expelled immediately the eyes of the heart upon removing of the veil of passions will as it were naturally begin to contemplate the mysteries of the scriptures since this is what led to mysticism do you understand that that that's what led to yes we know that the scriptures are uh, can interpret themselves, right? And that we have an understanding of that. But they ended up becoming mystics through this, right? They, they, they said they denied their flesh so much, got rid of sin so much that God showed them so much of the Bible because of that. It is evident that he did not believe transubstantiation because he saith, no body placed on earth can be in heaven. We find that he did not own auricular confession no more than Chrysostom, his master, because where he gives an account of the means whereby we may obtain the forgiveness of sins, he doth not mention one word of it. True it is that he speaks indeed of a confession of sins, but of such as one is to be made to God alone. And also by the confession of sin, he says, their forgiveness is granted. For saith he, I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. That's true. That's, that's, you know, what God says about that. Now, the, the, the observance of Lent. We are to know that as long as the perfection of that primitive church remained untainted, there was no such observation of Lent. But when the multitude of believers daily declining from that apostolic devotion set their hearts upon their riches, not distributing them for the use of all, according to the rule of the apostles, but applying themselves to private expenses, endeavored not only to keep what they had, but to increase it, being not content to follow the example of Ananias and Sapphira, then was it thought good by the universality of the priest to recall men that were entangled in secular business and in the manner ignorant of what continence or compunction meant, to this holy work by the canonical injunction of a fast. No reason for it. Right? Uh, he talks about the importance. He refers all faith to the scriptures. Wouldest thou know that thou, what thou art to believe? Thou hast the holy scripture. It is the perfection, perfection of reason to hold whatever thou readest there. When we read that he rules everything that he hath made, by this we... we we approve of his governing of everything because he says it. For all other that is human saying stand in need of proofs and witnesses. But God's word is its own witness because whatever, whatsoever incorrupt truth speaks must needs be an incorrupt witness of the truth. It's the Bible, amen? That's what he's talking about. He seems to approve of the difficulty which some of the Waldensians and Albigenses made to swear. He says this, our Savior commanded that Christians should not swear, right? So he held the same thing that the Albigenses and the Waldenses did about that. Uh, he absolutely provid, pro, forbids pride to those to believe themselves righteous on their own accord. This is also in, is intolerable pride and the highest wickedness for anyone to think himself so good as that wicked men may be saved by his means and concludes... For though a man may do his endeavor to please God, yet it is the highest kind of unrighteousness if he presume himself to be righteous. He passeth the same judgment upon those who believe they merit by their prayer. He said, neither do we ever live so as to deserve to have our prayers heard. So I want to ask you a question. 
Why are your prayers answered when they're answered? To glorify God. Right. To glorify God. But what? why are they answered? Yep. Yes. John 17. Jesus prayed that our prayers would be answered, right? That if we prayed anything in his name uh, that was consistent with his will, that God would hear it, right? And God always answers Christ's prayers. So, in other words... Basic, in other words, what you have to understand is your prayers as a child of God are answered because of what Christ did for you, not upon how good you are or how perfect you are. Now, that doesn't make me want to live a lascivious, wicked lifestyle. That makes me want to honor God and obey Him and follow Him. If that makes you want to live a lascivious lifestyle, then you must not have the Spirit of Christ in you. Right? Because it makes me want to follow him and obey him. And it makes me want to pray. Because I know that God is going to answer my prayers that are according to his will in Jesus' name. Because of what Christ did. I have a high priest that intercedes for me. Don't you? Don't you believe that? Don't you believe that Christ has everything to do with every single one of your prayers? Don't you believe the Trinity uh, has everything to do with your prayers? God the Father, who we cry out to, right? We cry out, Abba, Father, right? Right? Abba, Father. Don't you cry that out? Have you ever been in a place where you needed to cry that out? Abba, Father, I have been. God will put you in that place, so you cry out. Right? Abba, Father. And, and, and who else? That's the Father, Right? And then how is the Holy Ghost? What does He do? He moves it upon our hearts to pray, and He and He what? He intercedes on our behalf too, doesn't He? With groanings which cannot be uttered. You know not what to pray, right? Have you ever been in a place where you didn't know what to pray? Have you ever been in that place? Well, pray anyway, because God's gonna God's gonna use that. The Holy Ghost is gonna intercede for you, right? He's gonna help you. Amen, man. I know that's true. Come on. This is some good theology you're getting here in Baptist history right now. This is some good practical living. Don't make me start preaching on prayer. If I see a bunch of cold deadheads here, I'm going to start nailing prayer because I'm going to tell you what, you want to see something happen for God, you need to pray. God's people need to get praying. They need to be a praying people. If you got problems, you got prayer problems. That's what your problems are. Every single one of our problems are prayer problems. They need to be taken to the Lord in prayer. That's where they go. That's what you need to do, right? And then what else do we have? We have Christ that's involved. The whole Trinity is involved in your prayers because Jesus Christ, our prayers are answered upon Christ, upon his merit, upon what he did for us. And he is our high priest. He sitteth at the right hand of God, right? He is our high priest and he intercedes. The Bible says, wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them Christ intercedes for us so you see how the the all of the Godhead is involved in your prayers in the answering of your prayers God is involved completely in the answer to your prayers and prayer is so important it is so necessary right so and what this man Vicentius what he was saying was is that I mean your prayers aren't answered um right? Uh, because of how good you are. There's no merit in how good you are. Your prayers are answered because God loves you and he gave his son for you. Amen? So what does that do? That encourages me when I, when I have sinned against God, that I can go to him and if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Right? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So you can go to the Lord and confess your sins. Why? Because of Jesus. Right? And you can not only go, but you can go boldly. You not only go, but you go boldly. You ever had your child, uh, as, as they want something from you, and they come very boldly to ask you for it, or want something, you know, they come very boldly and openly and closely and intimately to ask you? Right? How many of you ask God for things like that? How many of you have a relationship with God like that to where you ask Him for everything? Right? 
How many ask God first? Vicentius, a priest of the monastery uh, of Larens, is one of those who can best inform us as of what happened at that time, right? He, he talked about that. Whoops, let's see. Let me back up here. I'm almost finished here. Okay, here we go. Oh, wrong one. Okay. Yeah, see, he talks about... Wow, this is a good one to explain about monks, too. He says here, he gives a perfect picture of the hypocrisy of the monks of his time who under a show of religion are slaves to the vices of this world, who having taken upon themselves the, a title of holiness after the reproaches and scandals of former crimes, do not alter their lives by a new conversation, but change their names by a new profession. And thinking that the sum of the worship of God lies more in their clothes than their actions, they have only changed their garments, not their minds. For they do almost all things in such a manner that you would not so much think that they had repented of their former crimes as that afterwards they had repented of their repentance, nor that at first they repented of their wicked lives so much as afterwards that they had never, they had ever promised to live well. A new kind of conversion this is. What is lawful they do not do and commit what is unlawful. They abstain from women but not from rapine. What is that? What's rapine? Do you know what that is? Hmm? Let's look up that word. Why don't we look it up? Let's do that. What's that? I didn't take those. Were they fun? <laughs> Here it is. In Webster's 1820, the act of plundering, the seizing and carrying away of things by force, violence and force to seize. So rape is what? Rape is violently taking a woman by force. That's what rape is. So rapine, rapine is what? Same thing. Only you're taking something else, right? You're taking it by force. He has this, he adds this. Sharp, by the way, what do the Roman Catholic bishops do and what have they done? They have taken things by force. What has what Rome built its fortune on today? Why does that Vatican have that big golden castle up there, Castle Grayskull and all that stuff? And why do they have them all over the world? And why did Donald Trump give them $1.2 billion? Because it's a whore church of the devil. Thank you. No. And how much are they worth? Trillions, probably. So there's not that much money. Oh, yeah, there is. More than that, they own kings. Right. Yep. Wow. Yep, they're going to burn in hell and not purgatory. Let's see here. He adds his sharp censure of them, that God never forbade marriage. O oh, foolish persuasions, what dost thou? God forbids sin, not marriage. Your actions do not agree with your profession. You must not be friends to crimes who pretend to be followers of virtues. He shows also that at Carthage they were extremely despised. Listen to this. When people saw those monks and those Catholic priests, here's what they said. And if at any time any servant of God from the monasteries of Egypt or the holy places at Jerusalem or from the holy and venerable retirements of the wilderness happened to come to that town to perform some divine office, he was no sooner seen by the people, but they all loaded him with opprobrious language, sacrilege, and curses. 
They hated him. And it wasn't for Christ's sake. They hated him because they knew what kind of scum they were. They knew what kind of wicked, vile perverts they were. Just like the Roman Catholic bishops that get drunk, that rape children and do all kinds of all those other things. Just like them. Amen. He shows that it's in vain for anyone to bear the name of Catholic if he does not answer that character. And he prefers the Goths and Vandals that were Arians to the Orthodox Christians of his time. Here's what he says about them. He says, they say if he are humble towards God, we rebellious. They believed victory to be in God's hands, we in our own. What can the privilege of a religious name avail us that we call ourselves Catholics, that we boast ourselves to be believers, that we despise the Goths and Vandals by reviling them as heretics, whilst we ourselves live as ill as heretics? If we be not found doing these things, the duties of true Christians, it is in vain that we flatter ourselves with the empty presumptions of the names of Catholics. He's saying you claim to be Orthodox Bible believers, but you live like devils. So why in the world would anybody want to be you? I'd rather be around those people, right? Because they actually believe what they live. They live what they believe, right? He sufficiently shows that prayer for the dead was at that time thought to be a very uncertain thing when he saith, but if either the violence of the disease be such or the carelessness of the sick hath been so great as to continue in their spiritual infection till they are a dying, then I do not know what to say or what to promise. It is better indeed to leave nothing unattempted than to ne neglect a dying person, especially because I do not know whether to endeavor anything at the last gasp may be a medicine. Sure it is that to try nothing is a certain perdition. So he's saying witness to them all the way till they're dead. I mean, you know, try to, but after they're dead, they're done. He expressly, he expressly excludes the doctrine of merits. For this alone, what equivalent can man pay for whom Christ gave himself by the suffering of most extreme pains? Or what will he render to the Lord worthy of him who owns God himself to be God by whom he was redeemed? Amen. Good, good stuff, isn't it? Uh, let's see if there's anything else I want to cover quickly. Oh, he says, drink waters out of thine own cisterns and running waters out of thine own well. And he was talking about the Bible. He says, by cistern, he means the Catholic doctrine that is of the Old and New Testament. And by the well, he understands the depth and height of the same Catholic doctrine. That is the various meanings of the Holy Scriptures. For in these words, he teacheth us to beware of the doctrine of heretics and to attend to the reading of the Holy Scriptures. So he's saying, go to the Bible. When he says Catholic, he means Orthodox faith pre-Constantinian Orthodox faith before apostasy. That it was agreeable doctrine. So you have to define that word because Catholics will be like, oh yeah, we're Catholic. No, you're not actually Catholic. Actually, we are a body Catholic and unified in unity, right? In that sense. And we believe the Orthodox faith. They don't. They just take the term, bastardize it, and lie about it. That well do they say Roman Catholic or Greek Orthodox because those are the persuasions and perversions that they follow. We follow that Bible doctrine, the Apostles' Doctrine. Amen. Found in the Scriptures. That's what we follow. Amen. He will have the author's meaning and not tradition to be the expli explication of Scripture. An author meaning inspired authors that wrote, that penned the scriptures, right? He's talking about Matthew, Mark, all of the men of Paul, those men, their original intent, right? By the ancient bounds, he understands the bounds of truth and faith, which Catholic doctors have placed from the beginning. He would have no man, therefore, receive the truth of holy faith and gospel doctrine any otherwise than it had been handed down to them by the Holy Fathers, and likewise commands that no man interpret the word of holy scriptures otherwise than according to the intention of each writer. Writer, right? He's talking about, like, the in scripture interprets scripture. That's a Baptist doctrine, right? Right? He does not own the Apocrypha. He says, how many books did Solomon publish? Three only, according to the number of their titles. Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Canticles. What does Solomon say in the Proverbs, or what does he teach in Ecclesiastes and his songs? Right? That's it. So nothing else. No missing Bible books. I get a kick out of people that are so conspiracy-driven. 
It's like, how can they even trust this? They don't even trust the scriptures. They're like, well, I think the book of Enoch should have been in the Bible, and it's a mistake that it wasn't, and they really tried to keep it because they wanted the secret teachings from you so you didn't know about things. They, they, they wanted to keep the book of Enoch from you, and the book of Jasher is supposed to be in there, and this and, and, and the third book of Judith and her, and her mom, whatever that is. Um, what's that? Yeah, the Gospel of Thomas, or the Gospel of Judas, or the Gospel of Judas. Man, Judas just got a bad rap. Well, you know, well, what would you expect an Antichrist to argue, right? Wouldn't you expect, hey, Paul, if an Antichrist walked up to you and he, and he told you that Judas got a bad rap, wouldn't you expect him to say that? You wouldn't expect him to say that Judas was a hell-bound sinner that rejected the gospel, that every opportunity to be saved by the grace of God, but rejected it and accepted the devil and followed him. Amen. Right, he got a bad rap too. Lucifer got a bad rap. I mean, he, he wasn't that bad of a guy. Pretty good guy, right? See, that's what, they, that's what they believe. But this man rejects, he rejected that, right? He assigns but two places whither the soul goes immediately. For by the tree man is understood because every man is as it were a tree in the wood of mankind. By the south, which is warm wind, is signified the rest of paradise, and by the north, which is cold, is signified the pain of hell. And meaning of it is where, whereof, wherever man prepares a place for his future abode, if it is the south when he falls, that is, he dies, he shall abide to all eternity in the rest of paradise and the glory of the kingdom of heaven. Now, I would disagree with his, his, his ice and, 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 uh, and uh, fiery you know, uh, explanations that he's giving to that, but I agree with what he's saying. He's basically saying you either go to heaven or you go to hell. You don't go anywhere else. Right. Exactly. Right. Exactly. But, you know, people use extra things. But, right, if you use it very specifically, there's nothing wrong with it, right? It's very, it's very clear. But, anyway, so, but what is he saying? There's only two places, heaven or hell. He's not giving you a purgatory, right? He's not, he's not, uh, what's that, the tree? Yeah, Paul just, that's what Paul said. Yeah, I'm not sure which, which verse it is. He makes it a great absurdity that a man should eat his own flesh, which yet follows the doctrine of transubstantiation. He said, but that expression, he eats his own flesh, is spoke by a hyperbole. What is a hyperbole? When anything is expressed that is incredible. How is this expressed hyper hyperbolically? He eats his own flesh because it is incredible that any man should eat his own flesh. But to aggravate the softness of this fool, he saith that he eats his own flesh to show that a fool rather desires his flesh should waste by hunger and by consumed by misery of want than to support it by the labor of his own hands. So he's saying that there are things in Scripture that are not, that are pictures of things. That they're not literal in that sense. But God always explains what those symbols mean, right? Jesus explained. He said these words are spirit and truth. They're spirit and life. And you can't receive them because they're spiritually discerned, right? He explains it to them very plainly. Did you find that verse? Yes. Go ahead and read it. Amen. Okay, so he explains, I grant that the prosper was in the... Okay, we don't need to do that. That's fine. We're almost done here. Anyway, I like, I like what, this man, what this man believed, right? He, he, was, he believed the Bible. He believed to turning to the scriptures. He understood these are Baptist people. Right? These are Bible believers that believe down to the century. He rejects the merits of good works and works of supererogation as particularly as if it had the eye of, to the papists. Wherefore, saith he, though we endeavor with all our labors of soul and body, though we exercise ourselves with all might of our obedience, yet nothing of all this is of a sufficient worth to be rendered or offered up by us as a deserving recompense for heavenly good things. No temporal obedience whatsoever can be equivalent to the joys of eternal life. Though our limbs may be wearied with watchings and our faces discolored with fastings, yet when all is done, the sufferings of this time will never be worthy to be compared with that, that glory which shall be revealed in us. So he's talking about the free grace of God. Amen. That's what he's talking about. 
We see clearly that he did not own the existence of the body of Jesus Christ in the Eucharist in the manner of a spirit because he maintains all creatures to be corporal and that if the soul is distinctly in a certain place because if it were otherwise, we must conclude it to be everywhere. That which is very strange is that Mamaritus, who hath refuted him, doth yet more directly thwart this doctrine of Rome by the various hypotheses which he proposeth when he confutes this with Faustus. But this century hath detained me too long. I proceed now, therefore, to consider the state of the diocese in the 6th century. I like that guy. <laughs> okay, I'm done, he says. Anyway, so basically you see that he didn't know. So there were orthodox, Bible-believing men that contended for the faith once delivered unto the saints and would not back off of it down through the centuries. These are the history of the Bible believers, the Baptist people that we trace. That's who they were. And this is the time of the 5th and 6th century when the rise of these heretics got even worse. And when I mean heretics, I'm talking about the ones that claim to be orthodox. But they weren't. They were heretics. Right? By the way, the heretics were virtually, in a sense of physically, most that were harmless. Now, their doctrine was perverse, but I can put down any heretic with this sword. I don't need another, a different sword. This sword puts down all heresy. You don't need a, a, the sword of, 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 the, of civil government to put that down. You need to pray for the souls of those people that are lost in, and they're, they're deceived. There's nothing worse than being deceived by Satan. There's nothing worse. And, and that's what these men understood. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you uh, for the truth. We thank you for a rich heritage that we have. We pray, Lord, that you just continue to instruct us. Help us understand these great truths. Thank you for all you do for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.